Welcome, and in this session, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 10. Now, this is a very important chapter as well, as, uh, as Yeshua, Jesus, the Lord, is talking a lot about his 12 disciples, calling them, giving them instructions, and uh, sending them out and such. And so, you know, let's, uh, let's get into this and read this. This is, uh, this is a, a very interesting uh, passage of Scripture here. Verse 1. He, speaking of Jesus, called to himself his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every sickness. Isn't this interesting that Yeshua, Jesus himself, basically gave his authority over to his disciples. Now, this is what it means. This is A lot of people don't, don't quite understand what it means to, to, uh, to do something in the name of Jesus. They think that if they just quote the the phrase in the name of Jesus that, that that means in the name of Jesus no it doesn't in the name of Jesus means that you are coming or in the name of whoever if you come in the name of somebody else you are you are saying i am sent by this person i have their i am representing them i have their authority I come in their authority. Now that's what Jesus, you know, when you say baptize in the name of somebody or or preach in the name of Jesus or whatever in the name of Jesus or in the name of whoever, it means to come and to be sent and to represent that person and to come in their authority. Okay? So yeah, so Jesus sent out the the the, uh, the 12 disciples in his name. You know, gave him the authority to, over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every every disease and every sickness. Verse 2. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who was called Peter, Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, John his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus, Le- Labius, who's also called Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot. Now, it says here in the notes that the NU scriptures, which are believed by some to be the oldest manuscripts, do, uh, does not have the, 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 uh, the phrase labius or labius, who is also called, um, who, was, who was also called. So it just has Thaddeus in there. So if it... Uh, if the NU is actually the oldest manuscripts, as a lot of scholars believe that it is, uh, then um, uh, the whole phrase labius, who was also called, was added later by who knows. Who knows added that later. But uh, the original oldest manuscripts would have had Thaddeus, just simply Thaddeus in there. Um also, it's, uh, it's, it's noteworthy to uh, understand that uh, a lot of Greek, uh, it, see the New Testament, the original manuscripts of the New Testament, was, it was written in Greek. And so a lot of the Greek naming conventions, a lot of Greek names, for some reason, they add S at the end. Thaddeus, Marcus, Lucas, Thomas, you know, Labius, you know, Judas. But originally, the S is not on the end of it, okay? Even Jesus, okay? Um, you know, like for example, uh, Judas, we know that the actual name would be Judah or more uh, accurately, Yehuda, because the, the, the letter J or the sound J is just not in the original Hebrew, uh, not in the original Hebrew whatsoever. So the the letter J or uh, the uh, the sound J is uh, is something that is pretty much relatively recent in uh, in 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 the, in the English language the the whole uh, uh, the whole sound in the in the letter itself. Okay, uh, if you look at the old English uh, documents, old English documents, you know, like five six hundred years ago. Um, you don't see J. It's like, it looks like an I because that's the way they would pronounce it, like an I. Yehuda or Yehudas instead of Judas. Um, now, another thing too you need to realize when it comes to the 12 disciples. When you read a portion of Scripture, one of the things you got to think about is who wrote what you're reading. 
You can't just read it and just think that, <laughs> you just assume that, I mean, you know, or a lot of people don't even think about who wrote it. They, they just read it. Uh, you got to think about who wrote it. Yeah, it makes a lot. It makes a big difference between, um, you know, if uh, if it was Peter, James, or John, or if it was another one of the twelve disciples, or if it was somebody out the, an outsider altogether. Look at it this way: for those of you who are really, really, truly seeking the Lord, you want to know the Lord better, right? And the only way to know to know the Lord better is to go to good sources. Now. Consider yourself or myself, for example. If you want to know me really well, and if I don't write anything, or if I didn't record any uh, any kind of vid- videos or audio or anything like that, what would you do? You'd go to people. You know, if I'm not around, you'd go to people who were around me, the you know, the, the closest to me, people who were the closest to me, um, my closest friends or my closest family members. Uh, the further away you go from the inner circle uh, of a person, the further away you count you get from the the uh, the actual accuracy and details about that person. Uh, so, for example, you know uh, the people who live you know in a community far from me. They may know about me, but they don't really know me. The people who live across the street from me, they may know me a little bit more. The people who are around me more know me more. The people who are with me more, I mean, you got some people, there's uh, people who are with me more than others. They would know me better, okay? And this is what the way it is with Jesus. We've got the 12 disciples who were with Jesus a lot more than the rest of the public was. So they would know Jesus a whole lot more. They would know the Lord a whole lot more. But within the 12 disciples, you have three of them that was actually with Jesus more than the nine. Uh, You read over and over again through the scriptures where Jesus took only Peter, James, and John with him in certain places, okay, to the Mount of Transfiguration or to go raise the dead here. You know, and so... Peter, James, and John were the inner circle. They had the inside scoop even more that uh, more so than the other nine, okay? So Peter, James, and John would know, more, know the Lord better. Let me say this again. Peter, James, and John would know the Lord better, know more about uh, Jesus, know more about the Lord, and have more details than the other nine. Now, the, the 12 would know the Lord a whole lot better and have more details about Jesus than the outsider. This is what you got to really think about when you're reading the scriptures. Okay, a lot of you really want to know God more. You really want to know the Lord more. I really encourage you to start reading uh, the Gospels, reading the words in red, you know, because this is what it's all about. It's about Jesus. It's about the Lord. So um, get to know the words in red, Okay. And then, before you start reading any other passage, read the books of Peter, James, and John, okay? The books that John wrote, the books that Peter wrote, the book that James wrote. If you really come to think about it, and I know this is something that a lot of you would not be able to really accept, but you got to have, you got to really... If you really want to expand your understanding about the Lord, you gotta you gotta enlarge your tent, okay? You gotta you, you can't be, as they say, so narrow minded that uh, you can look through a keyhole with both eyes, okay? So you got to uh, understand that Peter, James, and John, the books of Peter, James, and John, are more in harmony with one another than, let's say, the books the the book of Uh, Peter, James, and John, and the books of Paul. Paul, although a lot of people think that Paul, just because he calls himself an apostle, they think that he was one of the 12. Big mistake, big mistake. Just because Paul calls himself an apostle doesn't make him one of the 12 apostles, okay? It's very clear that um, the, the, the man who replaced Judas, you know, it's very clear in the book of Acts, chapter 1, that the man who replaced Judas was Matthias, okay? 
And it does not say anywhere that Paul replaced Matthias. And I I know some people believe that somehow Paul got the office of somehow Judas, you know, the the vacancy that Judas left was taken up by Matthias and somehow Paul snuck in there. That is really reading way too much into into the scriptures that it does not say. No, it does not say that. It says that Matthias replaced Judas, period. Okay. Paul was a completely different specimen, okay? He was not one of the 12, okay? He didn't, as far as we know, he did not walk and talk with Jesus, okay? Sure, he had he had an experience or a couple of experiences with the Lord, but he did not walk and talk. He did not know the Lord like the, the 12 did. And he certainly did not know the, know the Lord like Peter, James, and John did. So please take that into account when you read the books of Paul. You think about it. The books of Paul, they're all, they all have a common way of being written. Paul, you know, he's got a, like a, a, he's got a certain tone to his song, so to speak, that he, that he sings throughout his letters. And it's different than the tone or the song that Peter, James, and John sing, okay? Peter, James, and John, they speak a lot about holiness. They speak a lot about righteousness. They speak a lot about living right according to the ways, according to the law of God. Look at John, for example. I mean, James. Here's James, too. I don't want to forget James. James, he's the one that is saying... Hey, listen, it's not just believing. It is doing. You got to do it. I mean, you, you say you believe, well, you know, the devils do too. So what makes you diff- what makes you better? You've got to do what is right. You've got to obey the commands of God. Look at um, John. He's the one who said in 1 John 3, 4, that sin is the transgression of the law. A lot of people don't even know what sin is anymore. Why? Because they don't hear it in church anymore. These pastors, all they're doing is they're just preaching these gushy, gushy, um, you know, ear tickling messages that that they just want to please the people. They just want to make all the people feel good, and they want to get their hands shaken on the way out and say, "Oh, that was a good message." They want they want to please the board because they got to answer to the board later on. That is not the way it's supposed to be. Okay, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Um, Peter, James, and John, they have a common thread throughout all of their books, okay? And, and Paul has a common thread through, throughout all of his books. So you need to realize that, you know, Paul says a lot about grace and faith and this kind of thing. You don't see too much of that kind of stuff in the, in the books of Peter, James, and John. John's the one that said sin is the transgression of the law. Again, a lot of people don't know what sin is because they don't hear it preached at church anymore. Okay? That is a travesty. That is a that is terrible, okay? That is a tragedy that we don't hear t- uh, sin preached from the pulpit anymore. They used to preach against sin a lot, not anymore. It the church has become corrupt. So the people need to know what sin is. And most Christians don't know what sin is. They don't. Paul, or excuse me, John made it clear. Sin is transgression of God's law, the Torah. If you disobey, if you violate God's law, that is sin. Okay? And also, John took it even way further than that. He went way further than that. He said, if you sin, you are of the devil. (laughs) I know that slaps a lot of you in silly. You don't even know what hits you when I say that. Yeah. Yeah. That's what John said. John, yes, the beloved one of Jesus, the closest one to the Lord Jesus. Who laid his, you know, who was the closest one. The beloved disciple. He said, if you sin, if you sin, you are of the devil. (laughs) Hello? Uh, Again, where and when do you ever hear that preached in church? You don't because it's so corrupt. It is, again, the church, generally speaking, has traded in its salt for sugar. Okay? You look at Peter, on the other hand. He's preaching holiness. He's preaching righteousness. He's preaching living right so much. Okay? So much he's preaching holiness, righteousness, and living right. 
He said, you got to live spotless and, and blameless in this world. He, you know, his last word to us in Second Peter chapter 3 was, listen, you know, in, in, in the whole context of living spotless and living holy and living right, listen, don't, don't take Paul's letters out of context. Don't misunderstand Paul as some people do because what he writes is hard to understand. Don't misunderstand it because you misunderstand it and you and you you twist it to your own destruction is what Peter said. How how can that be? People misunderstand Paul. They think it's okay to sin. They think it's normal to it's not. For a Christian, for a, a believer in Jesus, it's not normal to sin. It's it wasn't normal for the disciples to sin, okay? They weren't going around sinning all the time. They just weren't. They couldn't. You have the light of the world right there. You have the light shining brighter than the sun right there before you're in the presence of it. There's no darkness at all. A lot of people don't know what sin is. Sin is not perfection in the, in the, in the, in the eyes of men. I mean, I can, I can write a letter. I can make a spelling mistake. Eh, that's a sin in the eyes of men. Not in the eyes of God, that isn't. It doesn't say anywhere in, in God's law, you sh thou shalt not make a spelling mistake. No, sin is transgression of the Torah. Okay? So that's very, very important to understand. So again, Peter, James, and John, they have a common thread of holiness, a common a thread of righteousness, a common thread upholding the law. As even Paul said, do you think we make void the law, the Torah, by faith? God forbid we uphold the law. We, we establish the law, he said in the book of, of Romans. You see, so a lot of people, they, they don't understand that. So they put a blindfold on when it comes to these kind of verses. Like, like Peter said, a lot of people do not understand the writings of Paul. And they misunderstand it to their own destruction. So it's better, listen, if you, want to know the, if you want to know the Lord more, if you want to know Jesus more, if you want to know the ways of God more, read the, read the words in red. Okay? When you get that down, read the books of Peter, the books of John, and the, the book of James. They were the closest ones, okay? When you get that down, read the rest of the scriptures the way, the way that it's, you know, we got a lot of scriptures, a lot of Old Testament, so-called Old Testament scriptures that are quoted, a lot of Apocrypha that's quoted that a lot of people don't, don't really realize, and we're going we're gonna to get into that in, in uh, future teachings. But there's a lot of things that are, that are quoted from previous, previous documents, previous scriptures that are quoted in the so-called New Testament, okay? And so get that down too, okay? Get that down. Understand it. You know, read it. Understand it. Memorize it if you can, <laughs> as much as possible. And then the last thing you should read is the books of Paul, okay? Understand the context of it all because it's... If Peter said that Paul's letters are hard to understand, you better believe it's hard to understand. I mean, if there's anybody that is a genius in the Christian faith, it would be Peter would be at least one of them. Uh, it's like he's like a genius. In the, I mean, if anybody really knew the Lord and knew the Scriptures, uh, I mean, the Apostle Peter is considered to be the rock. You know, the the uh, the one on whom the Lord Jesus continues to build the Church of God. Okay. Um, so he would be uh, a genius, uh, so to speak. If, if the genius said that Paul is, under, is hard to understand and people twist his letters to their own destruction, you better believe his letters are hard to understand and people twist it to their own destruction. It's almost like uh, Einstein saying that this certain mathematical equation is hard to understand. If he says it's hard to understand, you better believe it's hard to understand. Okay? So yes, it's impo it's important to understand the place, the hierarchy of the twelve, important and most importantly the top three: Peter, James, and John, and the top one being John. Verse twelve, or excuse me, verse five. Verse five, Jesus sent these twelve out and commanded them, saying, "Don't go among the Gentiles." Okay. Don't go among the Gentiles. Okay, so the message was not for just any Joe Blow. 
it was specifically geared for certain people, the Jewish people. Okay, now the Gentiles, if they wanted to yoke themselves up with the Jewish people, they were included with the Jewish people. A lot of people don't understand that when the children of Israel, when the Jews came out of Egypt, the mixed multitude came with them. So the mixed multitude, which included a lot of Gentiles, obviously would be the mixed multitude, um, was given the Torah as well as the Jewish people. Okay, so the Torah was given to the Gentiles too, the, to those who counted themselves in with the Jewish people. But Jesus said here very clearly, don't go among the Gentiles and don't enter into a city of the Samaritans. The, the Samaritans were half-breed Gentiles. Don't even, don't even go to the half-breed, I mean, half-breed Jews. I mean, the Samaritans were half-Jew, half-Gentile. They were, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were mixed Jewish people. Don't even go there. Rather, he said, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As even Paul said, the, the, the focus here, the primary object of the gospel are the Jewish people. Okay? A lot of people have lost that vision. Jesus said it. Even Paul said it in his letters far after the fact. Okay? First, the Jew, then the Gentile. The gospel comes first to the Jew, then the Gentile. The word of God came first to the Jew, then the Gentile. Salvation comes first to the Jew, then the Gentile. Verse 7. As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. Uh, the Textus Receptus, which would be the, like the King James Version, adds, raise the dead, and cast out demons. Again, just to quickly recap, the, the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, means that the kingdom of heaven is right there for you to take. Okay, Easy to attain. Easy to obtain. The kingdom of heaven. To be in God's kingdom. To be ruled by heaven. To be in the kingdom is with, within your reach. That's what it means. Okay, summarized, su summarized what that means is this. You can come into God's kingdom. You can let God rule your life. You can do it by obeying God because it is easy. At the end of the, so at the, end of the, the, uh, the giving of the Torah in the days of Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, he wrapped it all up by saying, listen, what, I'm, what God commanded us here is not hard to obey. It's not hard. It's easy. He's not asking us to, cly to, to somehow build a ladder up to heaven or dig into the core of the earth. Ah, it's easy. It's right there, right within grasp. And that's basically what Jesus said the message should be. It's easy to obey. It's easy to come under the rule and reign of God by his law and by his commands because it is easy. His commandments are not burdensome, as John said. Verse 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. Freely you receive, so freely give. Don't take any gold, silver, or brass in your money belts. That means don't take any money because why? He says right here, uh, verse 10, Take no bag for your journey, neither two coats, nor sandals, nor staff, for the laborer is worth worthy of his food. So back in those days, you see, uh, you would go from, when you're traveling, you would find someone in, within, a, within a village or a city or a town uh, that would be a worthy person, an honorable and worthy person. And you would, you would stay there for a day, two days or so, and you would work for that person. You would serve that person. And that's, that person would, would pay you by food or by clothes or, or that kind of thing. And so that's how you would earn a living. Okay. So that's what Jesus was saying. Don't, don't take anything because listen, you need to work. You need to work, uh, for you, for what you need. Okay. And he was just basically teaching, um, the people to work. There's a little bit of capitalism in here, don't you see? Verse 11, into whatever city or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy. This is what I was just saying. And stay there until you go on. As you enter into the household, greet it. Shalom Alechem, as they would say. Peace 
wholeness, God's blessings, God's wonderful peace to your mind, to your body, to your soul, to your spirit. Peace, basically, that's what that's how you would greet people uh, in you know in, in the Jewish way of doing it. You know, shalom alechem. If the household is worthy, let your peace come on it. If, but if it's if it isn't worthy, let your peace return to you. Verse fourteen: Whoever doesn't receive you, nor hear your words, as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. That is protest, my friend. That's protest. Even the dust of your house is not worthy to be on my feet. Even the dirt on your driveway is not worthy to be on my feet. Verse 15. Most certainly I tell you, it will be more tolerable, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Think about, think about that. Sodom and Gomorrah were the objects of God's wrath to the point of God causing fire to envelop those, those cities and surrounding um, areas. Burn these people alive, just as, it, just as it happened in Pompeii. Jesus said it'd be more tolerable. God would tolerate these people as much as he burned them alive because of their sin. God would tolerate them more than he would tolerate those who reject you. Wow, that's powerful. Verse 16, Behold, I send you out as sheep among wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Be wise, but don't sin. Verse 17, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils, and in their synagogues, and they will scourge you. They'll beat you. Verse 18, Yes, you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them and to the nations. But when they deliver you up, don't be anxious how, you will, how or what you will say, for it will be given to you in that hour what you will say. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of of your father who speaks in you. How comforting. Verse 12, or 21, excuse me. Brother will deliver up brother to death, then father his child. Children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. How horrible. You will be hated by all men for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Here, let's highlight this. He who endures to the end will be saved. Who will be saved? The ones who just say the sinner's prayer and go on with the rest of their life and just live like they always did? The ones who go to church and think that they're all good now? I got something to tell you there, friends. Most of the people who go to church are going to end up in a place that's not so good. Not so good. Jesus said those who, are, who will be saved are those who endure to the end. He just got through saying that it's going to be tough, boys. Hey, boys, it is going to be tough, okay? Fasten your seatbelts. The ride is going to be very rough. But if you endure to the end, you will be saved. Verse 23, but when they persecute you in this city, Flee to the next, for most certainly I tell you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man has come. The Son of Man here, Ben Adam, the Son of Adam, is what it means. The seed of Adam refer, is a direct reference to the Messiah. Verse 24, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his Lord. Very, very interesting. It is, it is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his Lord. Let me stop there for a second. You know, there are certain religions in this world or certain people that they have a leader 
that's not that doesn't have such a very good good reputation and they think they're going to be better they think they're not going to be <laughs> well without saying too much okay if you think you are going to be better than the leader of your religion, if you think you're going to be more peaceful, if you think you're going to be more civilized, wrong, buddy, wrong. Think again, friend. Think again. You're not above your teacher. A servant is not, not above his Lord. For it is enough. In other words, the the the, the pinnacle, the, the the peak of your experience will be if you were if you become like your teacher, or a servant like your lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul or Baalzebul, uh, excuse me, Baalzebul, which means literally a lord of the flies. Be Beel or Baal, which is the same as Baal in, in the Old Testament, so-called Old Testament. I hate saying Old Testament because that's you know, the disciples didn't have anything that was labeled Old Testament in their days. Even in the first century, they didn't have it. That was a addition by man later. But anyway, Baal Zebul is Baal or the Lord. Baal, Baal means Lord. Lord Zebul of the flies. If, if they have called the master of the house, Beelzebul, the Lord of the flies, how much more those of his household? Basically, Jesus said, listen, they called me the devil. They called me the devil. They, they said that I'm Satan. How much more? You guys, you're with me. You're, you're, you're part of my family. You're members of my household. Listen, if you're not called devil, if you're not called one of the family, if you're not called part of the family of the devil or of Satan, <laughs> check your faith, okay? Check your doctrine at the door. We're talking about the doctrine of Jesus here. Jesus made it very clear here. If you're with him, if you're really on par with, if you're really in line with him, they're going to be calling you part of the family, the household of Satan. Yeah, that's what it, that's what it says here. And if they don't call you that, if you're not being lab labeled a heretic or a, or a, a devil or a, or a child of the devil or, or a part of the family of the devil, then again, check your doctrine at the door there, friend, because it's not the right doctrine. This is what Jesus said, okay? This is what Jesus said. I'm, all I'm doing is just reading through the Bible and just, uh, we're, just, we're, just, we're just musing over exactly what the Lord said, the words in red. Verse 26, Therefore, don't be afraid of them, for there is nothing covered that it will not be revealed. In other words, hey, listen, understand. These people, these people, they think they're so good. Oh, yeah, they talk like they're so good. They talk like they're so holy. They talk like they're so right. I'm telling you, there's nothing covered that will not be revealed. Everything you do outside of these doors, everything you do in your little secret place, everything you do in another place you think that I don't see... Oh, it will be revealed. It will be revealed, says God Almighty. These people who are who are thinking like they're so good and they're calling you the devil or being household of the devil because of what you're saying, because you're in, you're really in line with the Bible, but those they are not in line with the scriptures. They're not in line with the scriptures, but you are. They're calling you of uh, the household of the devil. Don't worry. Ah. They got secrets that they're going to be, it's going to be revealed. Jesus said there's nothing hidden that will not be made known. Verse 27. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. Okay. What he's saying here is he's, he's basically just, he's juxtaposed to what he just said about these people are doing things in hidden places. They think they won't be found out. I'm telling you, what you do in the darkness, what you do, or what I tell you in the darkness, what I say in the secret, what I say in the, in the closet, what I say behind closed doors, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in the ear, what you hear whispered, proclaim it from the housetops. My friend, what you what you hear 
through these scriptures that I'm reading today. Proclaim it from the housetops. In other words, get yourself a megaphone, get yourself a PA system, get yourself a voice, get yourself some media, whatever you need to do, and proclaim it loudly. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body and are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy the soul and the body in hell, in Gehenna, which is hell. Okay? Here, Jesus is teaching what the scriptures obviously teaches all the way through is fear God. Just fear God, people. Fear God. I actually spoke to one person who thinks that, they, that Jesus might have been talking about teaching his disciples to fear the devil. Like, what? He taught his disciples to cast the devil out, not to be afraid of the evil. It says throughout the scriptures, don't be afraid of evil at all. Don't be afraid of evil. Don't be afraid of the evil one. You are, have authority over the evil. Don't be afraid of the evil. Jesus is saying, don't be afraid of, of a mere mortal who can kill you. But they're not able to touch your soul afterwards. They're not able to touch the real you, the real soul, your real self. They, they can just shed, you know, cause you to, you know, shed your skin, so to speak. Um, but rather fear him, obviously referring to God. Fear God who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, let me make it clear here because a lot of people say, oh, God doesn't send anybody to hell. Some of these, some of these people who are these, uh, what do you call it? These pe feel-good people, these, these people who subscribe to this feel-good gospel, they would say, oh, God doesn't send anybody to hell. He j you send yourself to hell by, 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 by rejecting Jesus. How shallow, how shallow, how shallow, how wrong that is. Not just shallow, but wrong. Who's the judge? Who is the judge? Who's got authority here? God, of course. Okay. Yes, God gives his authority to others. Well, you can, I mean, God will give his authority to others. Yes, but listen, he's the one, ultimately, that is the judge that will throw you people into hell, okay? He can, he can delegate that authority to other people, and he does. Okay, like, like I said before in a previous video, uh, God delegated his, his authority and his authority to judge to Jesus. Jesus delegated it to his disciples. And it also says that every Christian, talk about Paul, Paul said that every Christian, true Christian that is, true Christian, <laughs> true born again Christian. I mean, when I say born again, I'm not talking about just saying a sinner's prayer or just going to church. I'm talking about someone who's really, really, really living right for God. You've really died to, the, to sin and you've risen with Christ in newness of life. Those people who are really true, true sinners, or excuse me, those people who are real true Christians will judge the world. That's their job. They will judge the world. And not only the world, uh, Paul said, but also the angels. The angels. Yes, God has the authority. You don't send yourself to hell. Nobody send. Who in your right mind would send themselves to hell? It's like a criminal going to going to court and saying, "Yeah, I I I I plead innocent. I'm going to send myself to jail." Most people, you know, most sinners don't acknowledge their sin. They plead innocent. I plead innocent. I send myself to jail. Oh, uh, uh, officer, here, take me to jail. You think people actually? Send themselves to hell? They don't send themselves to hell. God does. And they can go kicking and screaming. They will. Look at the way Jesus said to the, to the ten virgins, to the, to the goats, and to many others, he said, at, when the time of judgment comes, when the day of judgment comes, the door will be locked and they will be pounding on the door. Let us in the end. Jesus will say, get away from me. I never knew you. Doesn't sound like they're sending themselves at all but rather that the Lord himself locked the door, locked them out, okay? They want to get out of hell. Trust me, they don't want to go to hell. <laughs> oh my, oh my. What people don't believe just to 
justify their ear tickling, feel good gospel ways. 29. Aren't two sparrows sold for one Assyrian coin? It says here that the Assyrian coin is a small coin worth about one tenth of a drachma or 16, 16th of a denarius. And an Assyrian is approximately the wages of a half an hour of agricultural labor. Half an hour wages. Okay. Aren't two sparrows sold for half an hour uh, labors or half an hour wages of labor? Not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Again, who is Jesus speaking to here? He's speaking to his disciples. Excuse me. He's speaking to those who are delegated by him to go out and preach the gospel. Not just everybody. Not just anybody. Verse 32. Everyone, therefore, who confesses me before men. A lot of people are ashamed to confess Yeshua. Everyone, therefore, who confesses me before men, will I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. What an awesome, awesome promise. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Mm, that is very, very, very serious. Verse 34. Don't think that I've come to send peace on earth. Okay, here's here's the here's the loving, lovey dovey, hippie Jesus that a lot of people believe in. That's the false Jesus. I'm just saying this sarcastically, obviously. Don't think, the real Jesus said, don't think that I've come to send peace on the earth. I didn't come to send peace, but a sword. I came to set a man in odds against his father and a daughter against her mother, a, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's foes will be that those of his own household, as it says in Micah, Micah chapter 7, verse 6. Now, what is Jesus talking about here? He's talking to the Jews. Remember this, okay? Now, when you believe in Yeshua, you're, it's going to be division. There's going to be division. That's what he's talking about. When you really, really sell out to this rabbi, Rabbi Yeshua, Jesus, there's going to be division. There's going to be division between you and your friends, between you and your family. How is that? Because they're not going to be into this holiness, righteousness, scripture thing like you are. They're going to not be into that. So you're going to have to do what the scriptures say over and over again. You're going to have to... Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Then I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. So that's what Jesus is talking about. A division between the believers and the unbelievers, between those who really accept the truth and those who don't. Okay? Again, look at, I mean, think about the context here. He's talking to Jewish people now, okay? And y'all know that when a Jew comes to faith in Yeshua... It's no laughing matter. It's no light matter. It's a serious thing. You will be divided. Your family will be divided. That's what Jesus is saying here. Don't think I've come so that everybody can hug and kiss everybody and everybody's going to be all unity. And oh, if, the, if, if there's disunity in the church, it's the devil. Oh, if there's disunity in the family, it's the devil. Oh, if there's disunity, in, you know, in the friends, it's the devil. No, it's not. Jesus said it is him. He, he's come to bring a sword. He's come to call you out and say, hey, you know, you, you're coming with me. Come and follow me. Leave them and follow me. Division. A sword. That's what he's talking about. He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. See, this is the context of it all. He's saying, if your father and mother, they might be believers, not be they may be not they may not be believers, but if you love them more than me, if you decide just to stay with them because you love your father and mother, be just because your love of them is greater than your love for me, and you decide to leave me out just for them, you're not worthy of me, he says. You're not worthy of me. Forget about it. You're not worthy of the kingdom of God. This is what the lovey-dovey Jesus says. Of course, I'm, sar or I'm sarcastic about this, okay? This is what the real Jesus says. 
if, if you love your father or mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. Don't love your father or your mother more than Jesus himself. Love Jesus. Love the truth. Love the scriptures more than anybody. He who loves his son or daughter more than me isn't worthy of me. In other words, there are, you know, there were people, there were people back in, in Jesus' day and even today. If you say, follow Jesus, follow the real Jesus, they know they're going to have to split up their relationship with their, with their family. They know that because their family is not compatible with the truth. Their family is not compatible with the scriptures. Their family is not compatible with the real deal, the real Jesus. Verse 38, he who doesn't take, take his cross, this is, you got to understand the cross in those days where it was an instrument of execution. It meant death. That's what it meant. Cross means death. It means executed. Okay? Executed, death, killed. He who doesn't, basically, if you're not worthy to be killed, you're not worthy of me. Huh? Yeah, that's what Jesus said. He who doesn't take up his cross and follow me isn't worthy of me. You're not worthy. If you are just um, hesitant to... To give up your life for, for Jesus? Forget it. See ya. Okay? You're not worthy. Don't even think about it. Forget it. The church doesn't need you. The, the pews are already cluttered up too much with people who don't... with half-hearted Christians. Churches are full of them. Verse 39. He who seeks his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Of course, this doesn't mean necessarily, literally, biologically, physically dying. What he means here, I mean, it could mean that, obviously. But what he means here is that you, you need to completely give up all of your will, your desire, all of your ambitions for God. Lose your life. Die for Jesus. That's what he means. Yeah. This is the, this is the hard truth sp spoken by the lips of the Lord himself. Again, how much of this do you hear preached at church? Hardly ever if never. Verse 40, he who receives you receives me. A lot of people they don't like street preachers today. Oh, well, I wouldn't do it that way. That's not loving. I guess you might be saying that against Jesus himself then. You got to realize, when Jesus is talking here, he's talking to his disciples. He's talking to the, he's sending them out to be open air street preachers. He's sending them out to preach repentance. You know, in context, that's exactly what he's what he's doing. It was the first message that he preached. It's the first message that his disciples preached. We'll get to that. He who receives you receives me. So if you next time you see someone standing on the corner with a sign that says repent, you should go shake his hand. Because that could be Jesus. That could be not really the not really the real I mean, you know, the that could be an ambassador of Jesus. That could be a represent that could that could be a person who represents Jesus. And then in judgment day, Jesus can say to you, yeah, when I was on the street corner, when I was preaching the repentance, like I always did, you shook my hand. You congratulated me. You encouraged me. Thank you. Enter into the joy of the Lord. When did we see you, Lord, on the street corner? Uh, we never saw you. Oh, yeah. When you said it, when you saw the least of these, my brothers preaching, you saw me. See, a lot of people that say, oh, yeah, there's a preacher on the street corner. He's preaching hard against sin, against preaching repentance. and you know, Oh, that's wrong. That's bad. You come judgment day there, buddy. Come judgment day. And, and Jesus will say, oh, well, hold on a second there, boy. You said that what I was doing was bad. What are you talking about, Lord? What are you talking about? We never saw you doing anything like that. Yeah, when you saw the least of these, my brothers, on the street corner, you saw me. Wow. 
Next time you see a street preacher and they're preaching really good, they're preaching hard against sin and preaching repentance, go, at least you can do is congr congratulate, congratulate them. The least you can do is shake their hand. The least you can do is, is do something good for them. Give them something. Give them a gift. Invite them over to your house. It's the Lord. It's a representation of the Lord. That person is an ambassador of the Lord. Again, again, this, you know, assuming or uh, in context, what I'm saying is, of course, if they are actually preaching the right thing, right? Repentance, righteousness, obey God. He who receives you receives me. He who receives me receives him who sent me, God. Verse 41, he who re receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Wow. If you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you will receive a prophet's reward. He who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. Isn't that all interesting as well? There are a lot of righteous people out there that a lot of people reject because, well, they're, they preach righteousness. I don't agree with what they're doing. They don't have to obey Torah. Sorry for your luck. You're not going to receive a righteous man's reward. That's your, if, that's your, uh, if that's your attitude. Verse 42, whoever gives one of these little ones just a cup of cold water to drink in my name, in the name of, of a disciple, most certainly I tell you he will in no way lose his reward. Yes. When you see people preaching the way Jesus preached, even if you give them a cup of water, you will get rewarded. That is the words in red. That is the words of Jesus. As you go, think about what we just said here today. Think about it. You're commanded to meditate upon his word, to keep it before your eyes all the time, to keep his word before your eyes. Keep it in your mind all the time. And may he open the scriptures as he did. It says, it says in the scriptures that, that the Lord opened the minds of certain disciples to the scriptures. May he open your mind. May he open your understanding to see the scriptures in a way that you've never seen it before. Be blessed in the name of Yeshua. Thanks for watching.